Welcome back to my channel and with this video we start our discussion on hand and wrist complex biomechanics. With starting on wrist complex and later on we will move on to the hand complex biomechanics. What is the functional significance of hand and wrist complex? I need not ask you that question because you know that right now when you are watching this video you observe my face which is of course handsome. The something else that you note is the hand movements. The different ways in which I move my hand to explain things and make you understand. If I was taking this class like this, how boring it would have been. Even though I would be saying the same words and same way of explanation. Because the hand has such diverse role in all of our daily activities which makes the hand and wrist complex one of the most complex joints in human body. But in the hand, but in the ankle complex, you did not have any fine task but here you have very fine precisely controlled motor task possible with your hand and wrist complex that is why we often say that uh, it's a brain that designed the civilization the entire oh. was developed with the developed with the ideas of human brain but it's our hand that created it such significant is the hand and wrist complex here we will be discussing hand and wrist complex in the most simplified manner so that you won't forget what are the different structures that are there in the hand and wrist complex ever in your life and in this video we will be seeing about the wrist complex function the structure of the wrist complex the two joints that are seen in the wrist complex then some conditions like a ulnar variance and the ulnar post that is the ulnar positive and the ulnar negative variant and finally the normal range of motion that is possible in the wrist complex complex is actually a compound joint that is because there are two individual joints that are seen in the wrist complex like in the knee complex which was also a compound joint or a compound complex the two joints that are seen in the wrist complex can answer that is a radiocarpal joint that is a radiocarpal joint and the second one is a mid carpal joint the word itself is self-explanatory. Radiocarpal means the radius is articulating with the carpal bones, right? And the mid-carpal bone joint means it's a joint between the carpal joint bones. Okay, it is joined between the carpal bones. So these are the two individual joints which forms together the wrist complex or the compound wrist joint that is the radiocarpal joint and mid carpal joint. Since here there is a carpal, here is the carpal. So the wrist complex can also be known as the carpus. Wrist can also be known as the carpus, right? Now, you all know that our major goal of our daily activities is reach something with the hand, do something with the hand. The entire upper limb is actually helping in this task. For example, the shoulder acts as the base of support for all the movements. What does the elbow do? It helps in reaching the object. It helps in uh, reaching the hand back to the, taking the hand back to the body. The forearm also help in positioning of the hand. But what about the wrist? What is the function of wrist complex? Does it help in the positioning? But more than positioning, wrist complex serves one important function. A very crucial function. That is, wrist complex maintain the length tension relationship of length tension relationship of the forearm muscles. The length tension relationship of forearm muscles because you know that the forearm muscles the flexors and extensors passes through the wrist and reaches the hand so the position of the wrist in fact determining the length tension relationship whether the muscle is in its full potential or whether muscle can generate the maximum capacity or not there is an optimal length you know that there is an optimal length when muscle is capable of producing the maximum power. You need not worry about that. Just remember that the wrist complex serves a very crucial function of maintaining the length tension relationship of the forearm muscles, the, the extensors and the flexor muscles of forearm. So this crucial role cannot be done by the elbow, 
uh, the shoulder or even by the hand joints. So that is why the wrist and hand complex is one of the most complex joint and even in that the wrist complex is much more complicated and much more complex than the hand joint. And you should always remember this complex joint varies in shape between different persons. For A and B, if there is an individual A and B, the wrist complex shape and the structure would be different from that individual. So there will be some structural changes. You, might, you should remember that throughout in your lifetime. At the same time, very simple, minute changes in the wrist complex can produce a lot of functional imbalance in the hand complex. That is because of this maintenance of isometric or length to tension relationship of forearm muscles. Am I right? So the wrist complex is made up of two joints that is a radiocarpal joint and mid-carpal joint. Therefore, the wrist complex can also be known as the carpus and the wrist complex has a very crucial function of maintaining the isometric or length tension relationship of forearm muscle. And you should always remember it can vary between individuals and very small changes also produce abrupt changes in the function of hand complex or hand as a whole. Always remember that. Now let us straight away move on to the wrist complex joints that is the radiocarpal joints. Now that is the radiocarpal joint. Yes, the radiocarpal joint like the word itself, it is made up of articulation of radius, exactly speaking, the distal end of the radius. But what about the anna? Why anna is not the we will discuss that later. And the radio ulnar disc, the radio ulnar disc, the triangular fibrocartilage complex. The radio ulnar disc is in fact a part of the triangular fibrocartilage. And finally, by the carpal bones, the scaphoid, the lunate, and trichodrum. And trichodrum. Okay, so these are the articulations that you see in the radiocarpal bone. That is the distal end of the radius, the scaphoid, which is the carpal bone, the lunate and the trichotrum. So these three bones and the radius, along with what the radio ulnar disc and triangular fibrocartilage. Here you have the radio ulnar disc and the triangular fibrocartilage is seen there. So the triangular radio ulnar disc is in fact a part of the triangular fibrocartilage. Since this radio ulnar disc covers the articulation surface of the ulna, we don't consider ulna as a part of the wrist complex. So the radiocarpal joint is formed between the distal end of the radius, the radio ulnar disc, here it is the disc, the triangular fibrocartilage, the scaphoid, lunate and the trichotron. So which will be the proximal articulating surface? The proximal articulating surface will be the radius, radio ulnar disc and the triangular fibrocartilage. The scaphoid, lunate and trichotrum will be the distal articular surface. So the distal articular surface would be the scaphoid, lunate and the trichotrum bone. Now let us look into the proximal articular surface. The proximal articular surface is actually a biconcave shape, a biconcave shallow sh radial radius. It is actually a biconcave shallow radius or the biconcave shallow distal end of the radius. Now you must see that the distal end of the radius here you have the radius over here. This is the distal end of the radius. If you look closely, you will see some facets in the distal end of the radius. Some facets in the distal end of the first radius. Here you can see that there is one facet over here. There is another facet over here. So this facet which is seen in the lateral end, which is the lateral end, is known as the lateral radial facet. That would be articulating with which bone? The scaphoid. So the distal end of the radius has that lateral facet which articulates with the scaphoid. Then there is a medial radial facet which articulates with the lunate. So the medial radial facet articulates with the lunate. Then there is the triangular fibrocartilage which articulates with the trichodrum. 
and sometimes with the lunate also and finally there is the radio ulnar disc which is also articulating with the trichotron clear am i clear so once again i will explain that so in the distal end of the radius you have to subdivide it again there are some facets two facets one lateral facet which is articulating with the skull here then there is a medial facet which will be articulating with the lunate then there is a medial facet which is articulating with the lunate then there is triangular fibrocartilage which articulates with the trichotron and then is the radio ulnar disc which also articulates with the trichotron the triangular fibrocartilage can articulate with both lunate and the trichotron mostly it is articulating with the trichotron and in some cases it can be articulating with the lunate exceptionally in the especially in the neutral resting position of the wrist joint so you must always remember this now i want to take forward your discussion into the distal end of the radius or radiocarpal joint you must see that the radiocarpal joint is distal end of the radius or radiocarpal joint is oblique in nature the radiocarpal joint is slightly oblique in shape and it is oriented and it is oriented ulnarly and volarly Am I confusing you? I will explain this one. Then it will be AC. So, just look at this one. This is the radius. Okay. Now, always remember, you must keep the hand in anatomical position. And at this time, you can see that from here, the radial end is passing over like this. But at this end point, you can see that the radius is turning medially. Even though this end, uh, the radius styloid is larger, this is actually tapering to the medial side. That is, if you draw like this, a radius at the medial side, at the end, the styloid comes like this and it moves. So, there will be some inclination to the medial side. Of course, medial side you have which bone? The ulna. That means the radius is or the distal radial nerve joint, sorry, the distal radiocarpal joint is oriented, oriented ulnarly. That is why we say that this side is the ulna. This is oriented towards the ulna. I am exaggerating that picture for your understanding. So this one is actually oriented towards the ulna. Therefore, we call it as ulnarly oriented. So the radial distal radiocarpal joint is un, radiocarpal joint is ulnarly oriented. And that is why, why is that? Because the lateral end of the radius is slightly larger than the medial end. That is the lateral end of the radius. You can see that the lateral end of the radius is slightly larger than the medial end by 12 centimeter. By 12 centimeter. Okay. So this radial deviation, so this ulnar deviation would be of 23 degree. So if you draw it like, like this, the deviation would be of 23 degree. So you can say that distal end of the radius in radiocarpal joint is 20 degree radiate deviated to the ulna. Always remember this one is oriented to the ulna. Ulna is over here. So this is oriented to the ulna. This is oriented to the ulna. That is why we call it as ulnarly oriented. So the first term ulnarly oriented is okay. Now the second one it is volar in nature or it is oriented volarly. Now you just look at this radius. You can see that this end is in fact like a spoon. It's, cup, it's, it's just shaping like a spoon. It's oriented to this direction. What is this direction? What is this direction actually? This is the volar side. This is the dorsal side. This is the volar side. So we call it distal end of the radius volarly oriented. So the distal end of the radius is volarly oriented by 11 degree. So if you look at the from the dorsal and volar side, we can find out that it is volarly oriented by about 11 degrees. 
am i right so this is all about the radiocarpal joint the radiocarpal joint is a radius and duodenal disc and triangular fibrocartilage it has two facet a lateral and a medial facet the respective articulations you should must remember and finally most important point that you should remember here is that the distal radio ulnar joint is ulnarly oriented by 23 degree because of the 12 millimeter increase in length this 12 millimeter this is 12 millimeter 12 millimeter increase in length and it is volarly oriented it is scooped up like that that is uh, by 11 degree 11 degree scooped out 23 degree ulnarly oriented 11 degree radially or uh, uh, volarly oriented and now let us look into the distal row the distal row the distal row is made up of the scaphoid lunate and trichotron the distal row of the radiocarbon joint is made up of which joint bonds the scaphoid lunate and trichotron now compare this one this is scaphoid lunate trichotron here trapezium trapezoid capitate hamlet this is the distal uh, carpal bonds. This is the proximal carpal bonds. So don't get confused. The distal row of radiocarpal joint is made by the proximal carpal bonds. Is there something to be confused? The distal row of the radiocarpal joint is made by the proximal row of the carpal bone because comparing the carpal bone this one is the proximal bone because uh, trapezium trapezoid capitate hamate all are away from the uh, away from the body that is distal row okay so that is formed by scaphoid lunate and the trichotron so the distal uh, so the the distal end or proximal segment is made by the distal segment is made by scaphoid lunate and the trichotron then what about the pisiform bone the pisiform bone is no even though it's anatomically a part it's not forming any significant role in the wrist complex now you must remember that this um, bonds that is the scaphoid lunate and trichotron let me draw it somewhere over here the bonds the scaphoid for example you have scaphoid over here which is a board shape then you have the lunate over here and the trichotron so these are the bonds is these bonds are actually connected together by some ligaments okay some connected together by some ligaments if the scaphoid and lunate is connected it is called a scaphoid interosseous ligament okay this lunate and trichotron is related. So, luno trichotron, the name itself you can find out. Interosseous ligament. No, never by heart this one. Just remember that there are some ligaments which connect that bonds. So, that are known as the scaphoid interosseous, luno trichotron interosseous. So, these ligaments as well as these bonds are covered by the cartilage. Okay, this ligaments as well as the bones are connected by the cartilage and they act as one single segment. All other joints, the ligaments may act as different segments. Different joint bones act as different segments. But here, they all act as one single segment but not a rigid segment. Always remember, not a rigid segment. It is a collapsible, flexible segment. That is why it can change shape according to the need of the hand. The can, can, hand can be approximated easily with the hand. That's all we will that all we will study later. But at this time, remember the distal row made up of scaphoid, lunate, and trichotron is connected by some ligaments, interosseous ligament, scaphoid lunate interosseous ligament, luno trichotron interosseous ligament, and this interosseous ligaments as well as the bonds are covered by the cartilage cartilage and together they act as a single flexible segment and formed bond do not form a part of this one there are actually two important things that you must remember when we are dealing with the wrist complex that is the first one is about the inconcurrency of the joint inconcurrency of the joint you know that there is the proximal radiocarpal uh, row and the distal radiocarpal row but if you look the proximal and distal radiocarpal row we see that there is only a maximum of 20 percentage contact between distal and the proximal row. For example, this is the proximal row. 
just remember this is the proximal row radius and alna here you have the distal row there will be only 20 percentage of contact between this this proximal row and this distal row of the radiocarpal joint and this makes the joint highly incongruent. This 20 percentage can increase when there is a functional task or when there is an increased stress to up to 40 percentage, but not complete 100 percentage articulation is seen. So this makes the joint highly incongruent. But this incongruency is good for the joint as well as this oblique nature oblique nature it is volarly and ulnarly angled also so that angulation and this incongruency helps in having greater amount of function in the wrist complex in the radiocarpal joint you can see that flexion is there greater amount of flexion is there extension is there ulnar deviation radial deviation so normally the flexion extension is greater than radial and ulnar deviation of course you can see that this is the flexion extension this is the radial and ulnar deviation but ulnar deviation this ulnar deviation is greater than the radial deviation so normally there is a flexion and extension which is greater than ulnar deviation and radial deviation whereas ulnar deviation is greater than radial deviation when you compare ulnar to radial deviation the second important thing that you must note is about the term known as variance or ulnar variance. The ulnar variance can be of three types. One is the normal one, normal ulnar variance or normal, positive ulnar variance and negative ulnar variance. What do you mean by ulnar variance? Ulnar variance, it's uh, all about the ulna actually. So see the situation in which here you have the radius and here you have the ulna. When the radius and ulna is almost in a straight line, we call it as the normal or neutral ulnar variance. Neutral ulnar variance. When there is a situation in which our radius and ulnar's distal ends are almost in a straight line, then we call it as neutral ulnar variance or normal variance. Then what is the second scenario? The positive. Positive means it should be a positive one, right? So the ulna will be slightly greater than that of the radius. When ulna is greater than that of the radius length, distal end length, then that is known as the positive ulna variance. Then what about the negative? The ulna will be having a length which is less than that of which is less than that of the radius. So the radius will be on the higher side. So that is known as the negative ulnar variance. So we have three terms, positive variance, negative variance, and normal or neutral variance, all with respect to ulna because it's all about ulna, ulna, and ulnar variance, okay? So just remember it's all about ulna, whether it is neutral, neutral means both are at the same length, whether it is a positive means ulna is greater, when it is negative, ulna is a negative that means less in length so what happens actually here what happens over here here you know that there is a structure known as the triangular fibrocartilage and radial nerve disc the triangular fibrocartilage okay what happens is the radial nerve disc is a part of triangular fibrocartilage what happens in a positive ulnar variance and negative ulnar variance when there is positive ulnar variance for example, this is the positive ulnar variance. The triangular fibrocartilage gets impinged with the, which one? The carpal bones. The triangular fibrocartilage becomes impinged with the carpal bones because this end is higher. When there is a negative ulnar variance, the triangular fibrocartilage will not get impinged, but uh, the triangular fibrocartilage will have a greater amount of uh, freedom at that point. So, when there is a positive ulnar variance, the triangular fibrocartilage get impinged. And as a result, structurally, triangular fibrocartilage will be thinner in case of ulnar variance positive. That means, structurally, the ulnar variance positive will result in triangular fibrocartilage becoming thinner, so that less impingement occurs. 
because already impingement can occur when it's a positive variance at the same time when under variance is negative what happens the triangular fibrocartilage thickens itself Triangular fibrocartilage is thickened. So, in positive ulnar variance, the triangular fibrocartilage is thinner and it gets impinged. Whereas in negative ulnar variance, triangular fibrocartilage is thicker. But you should remember that in negative ulnar variance, the stress at this joint is very high. The radial end will be very high. So the stress at the radial end will be very high and it can result in a condition known as keen box disease or which one a vascular necrosis of a vascular necrosis of lunate the keen box disease is known as a vascular necrosis of lunate so in case of negative positive ulnar weight negative ulnar variance there can be increased stress at the lateral end and it can result in a condition known as uh, a vascular necrosis of lunate or keen box disease so just remember that so so the, this is all about the ulnar variance positive and negative ulnar variance how can positive ulnar variance occur normally it do not occur anatomically but if there is some fracture to the ulna and there is an improper healing sometimes the length of the ulna can increase and result in positive ulnar variance so these are all about the ulnar variance now straight away we move on to the mid carpal joint let us see the second joint in the wrist complex the wrist complex is in fact made up of two joints we uh, learned it earlier one is the radiocarpal joint and next one is the mid carpal joint what is that mid carpal joint the radiocarpal joint and the mid carpal joint so the mid, mid carpal joint is in fact made up of we have here scaphoid lunate triquatrum trapezium trapezoid uh, capitate and hamate okay so the mid carpal joint will be formed by the proximal row of the carpels the proximal row includes our scaphoid our lunate and our triquadrum so the scaphoid lunate and the triquadrum with the distal row made up of trapezium trapezoid capitate and hamate so this joint which is seen in between the proximal and distal carpal bones is known as the mid carpal joint so this is the mid carpal joint mid carpal joint so that is seen between the proximal and the distal carpal row this is the proximal row this is the distal row so that joint is known as the mid carpal joint so mid carpal joint is formed between the proximal row of the the carpal scaphoid lunate trigotrum with the distal row of the carpels made up of trapezium trapezoid capitate and hamate now when we look at this joint we see that the joint is not a perfect anatomical joint but a functional joint because we don't have a regular complete articular surface over here the articular surface is highly varying with respect to each of the bone so we cannot call it as a pure anatomical joint but a rather a functional joint and we also see that the articular surface are reciprocally concave convex the articular surfaces are reciprocally concave convex with respect to each bone scaphoid surface may be concave then trapezium will be convex similar to that it is having uh, uh, what is called reciprocally concave convex so always remember this joint is mid carpal joint is not a pure anatomical joint but a rather a functional joint because it do not have a completely well defined articular surface but there are ligaments and there are capsules also okay but there are ligaments and capsules which and the synovial lining etc are present but it is not anatomical because there is no well-defined articular surface and also remember that the articular surfaces are reciprocally concave convex and finally you need to just remember this important point this is the 
distal row of radio carpal bonds and this is the proximal row we saw that this row is a mobile one or collapsible one or not a rigid segment but this row is a rigid segment this row is a rigid segment that is the distal carpal row is a rigid segment so what happens here is that in the mid carpal joint if you look the range of motion flexion and extension extension will be greater than flexion if you look radial deviation and ulnar deviation radial deviation will be greater than ulnar deviation that is exactly opposite compared to the radiocarpal joint but do you need not worry it because we are considering wrist complex as a whole when you compare the wrist complex as a whole you have flexion greater than extension you have radial de ulnar deviation greater than radial deviation but in the mid carpal joint exactly opposite is happening but in radio carpal joint the same phenomenon as in the complete wrist complex but if you take the wrist joint as a complete one we have the range of motion of the entire complex as flexion greater than extension okay and under deviation greater than radial deviation the flexion values will be 65 to 85 degree normally extension values are 60 to 85 degree normally and radial deviation will be 15 to 21 degree but there is a considerable increase in the ulnar deviation that is 20 to 45 degree so this is the normal range of motion of complete wrist complex as a whole but in radiocarpal joint you have uh, flexion greater than extension radial deviation ulnar deviation greater than radial deviation but in the mid carpal joint you have the exactly opposite phenomenon that is seen so this is all about the wrist complex in general which includes always remember two joints radius with the carpal radiocarpal joint carpals between the carpals that is a mid carpal joint proximal with the distal one that is a mid carpal joint now we have to see the ligaments etc and muscles of this joint and the function in detail which we will see in the next session until then stay tuned and if you like the video don't forget to click the like button and kindly subscribe to our channel